Okay. Good morning. Uh, I feel like we needed walk-up music or something. Next next time, make that happen. Yeah. I didn't realize that uh, I woke up today and my goal was going to prove uh, Neca's mom right that he chose the wrong career. But you know, I'll I'll do my best. Uh, thank you, first of all, for for inviting me into this. Uh, it, being from uh, representing a utility in a sister city to DC, uh, hopefully bring some both learnings and and. Um, you know, hopefully you choose the challenge that I pointed out. I am a more of a DC resident than a Baltimore resident, given I'm from Northern Virginia. So certainly see some of the challenges uh, here as well. I would love to be part of uh, the solutions here. I I'm gonna start out today just saying happy Diwali. Uh, today is uh, Mark's Diwali. And uh, you know, it's the, the, most, the most celebrated holiday uh, among Indian households, I would say. And, uh, and it, it symbolizes a number of things. It's the start of the new year. Uh, it's supposed to uh, be a celebration of the, the triumph of good over evil and of light over darkness. And it felt like it was a, a great theme for a presentation today when we're talking about taking climate action against climate change, right? At the end of the day, you know, similar to what HG said earlier, this is big, right? If we can do something about it, if, if all y'all in this room can can figure out a solution that, that impacts one family, two families, 100 families in the district, that's impactful. What if it's 1,000 families, 20,000 families? That's, that's really impactful. So let's think about that today, regardless of what the solution is that you choose. I mean, I'm ready to, to, to get started on any of those. They, they all sound like great ways to, to make an impact. So I wanted to provide a little bit of context of what have we been doing up in Baltimore in the, and in Central Maryland that's been going right, right? Where have we been bringing light to the darkness of, uh, of climate action, especially when it has to do with transportation electrification? And just a handful of things that we've been up to over the last couple of years. We're at the midpoint of a demonstration program, a pretty broad portfolio of different things that are going on uh, that we're implementing in order to try to drive electrification in Maryland, uh, I guess pun intended these days too. Uh, Maryland has a goal of 300,000 EVs on the road by 2025 and is behind, right? That is a huge goal that they are, they are you know, likely not going to meet at this pace. That said, that doesn't mean that you stop trying because you need to hit these goals and we need to do everything that we can. Handful of the things that we've been, been up to that are going well, right? We're, we're, we're shining some light here. Uh, we have rebates that we were given to residential customers to engage in uh, smart charging act so that we can actually get the data to see how our customers charging. $300 rebates for either uh, smart charging, leveraging smart chargers, or giving us access to their vehicle telematics. Uh, right now, only for Teslas, but we're hoping to expand that too. Uh, some pretty cool stuff. We're building our own uh, BGE owned and operated public infrastructure, a network of 500 charging stations across central Maryland. We have about 180 to 200 in the ground right now, a mix of level two chargers and DC fast chargers. We have to place our chargers on property that's owned or operated by state or local government but is available publicly 24-7 uh, in most cases. Uh, and, uh, and so we're having success there too. I think 440 of the chargers have sites that are kind of identified and spoken for. They're in some stage of engineering or design. We hope to have all 500 uh, spoken for, uh, at least by the, uh, if, hopefully by the end of the month, if, if at all possible, but certainly by the end of the year. We have an EV only time of use rate. Again, thinking about how does the utility adopt to adapt to this, this change that's coming so that we can better support it, so that we're not slowing down people as they want to electrify, whether they're residential customers or uh, business customers or governmental customers that have larger fleets that they want to electrify. So we have an EV only time of use rate that's encouraging customers to charge at a certain time. And it's being very effective for those customers that are taking advantage of it. Again, this is without setting a second meter, leveraging smart data from their chargers or directly from their vehicle telematics to build them a time of use rate. Um, that is, uh, it's quite a nice incentive. We have some DOE funded programs. We saw that there were gaps in the programs that were approved by our Maryland Public Service Commission uh, for that there were gaps from what we really wanted to do. What's the vision? How do we drive more equity? How, how do we 
do more uh, with our system to really understand how the, how the, uh, the electrification is going to impact our system. So we went out and got a couple of DOE grants, one for managed charging and one for an EV rideshare program uh, to bring 100 electric vehicles into the greater Baltimore, Washington area that are going to be focused on limited income communities when it comes to the infrastructure, as well as transportation access programs, trying to create opportunities for affordable point-to-point -point clean transportation for, uh, for residents that you know, may otherwise not be involved in transportation electrification for a very long time. Um, we've our own fleet electrification, uh, PHI, PEPCO does as well. This is across Exelon, but it's 50% by 2030. And that includes all of our light duty as well as heavy duty. And as you can imagine, we've made a lot of inroads when it comes to our light duty fleet, and we've had to be creative with our heavier duty vehicles. And hopefully the products are gonna come to market that allow us to, to get to where we wanna be. Um, and then education has been such a big part of, of it for the utilities here. I, I think, NECA, you would agree, too. In addition to offering the solutions, in addition to providing safe, clean, and affordable energy, it's also uh, customers are coming, us to, to, coming to us to learn about what does it mean to drive an electric vehicle. So providing them the right information, the right tools. Now, we may not have all the solutions, but at least we can tell them, here's the start to your education, what it means to electrify your transportation. The dark, and that's why we're here today, is, is to figure out, okay, what is the challenge that we're facing Yes, in, in Central Maryland, in Baltimore, and here in the district, too. And the darkness for us, as we've seen it, as we've started to implement these programs, right, you, you throw these tests out there and you see, well, what's working, what's not? And this is really valuable information as you start to think about what to do in the district, too. We've got a really extensive multifamily program that was going to allow us to provide 700 rebates for multifamily uh, properties to add charging. Um, it included 5,000 per port for level two charging. It included 15,000 per port for DC fast charging, and it is very undersubscribed. And, and, and not just because we put the program out there and, and on a website and forgot about it. We've really been hitting the pavement, trying to get property owners, property managers to take action, to, to move this needle, to get them. And, and we're giving out money. What more can you do? Well, you know, there are other things that, that you can do, and that's what we have to figure out. But there are challenges here. Uh, and, and I would say the challenge is important when it comes to equity to think about multifamily. Think about how many customers in central Maryland for us uh, that are limited income that live in multifamily housing. Multifamily doesn't just include apartments or condos. It also includes row homes that don't have garages. It also includes townhome communities that are, that are all across central Maryland. So you can imagine there are a lot of customers that will have no opportunity to electrify their transportation because it's difficult to rely on public charging even if the public charging is there from a cost perspective, is it equitable that to, to provide public charging to customers if you're gonna charge them four times, five times as much as what they would uh, have, to, have to, what it would cost them to charge an electric vehicle if they had a garage and could afford a charger at home? I would say you know, probably not, that's not an equitable solution. But multifamily owners also have their reasons for, and, and managers have their reasons for not pursuing this. A handful of them uh, are, um, you know, they've got a lot of interest to deal with. Sometimes it's condo boards or community associations. Sometimes it's people don't want their parking spots taken away. But some of the consistent concerns are, who pays for this electricity? If I'm putting this infrastructure in, who's going to pay for it and how? Uh, and it's not just the energy right capacity, as many people in this room, room know, right? Those capacity charges can be very significant, especially early on. Um, there are also concerns about parking space availability, as I pointed out. Uh, and, and even in situations where we're trying to give these things out, the question is, well, we, we're already uh, constrained for parking. If you dedicate two of them to chargers, this is going to be a real problem, especially because my residents aren't driving EVs right now. Uh, and so they would rather not think about it. And then the large upfront costs. Yes, we're giving away this, these dollars, these incentives to get it done, but it can cost a whole lot more to install electrification depending on how old your building is. Do you have a parking garage? Even if you don't, if you do or don't, how far away are you from you know where the where the parking spaces are that you want to dedicate for EV charging from you know where the electric infrastructure needs to be to tie that in? A lot of challenges here, and and I'm not pointing the finger at at multifamily property owners and managers. They're running businesses, and their residents haven't necessarily started to electrify. But again, we've talked about this chicken and the egg. Where do we start? How do we do that? Um, and so. We've certainly tried, like I said, not just relied on just the incentives out there. We've tried a handful of things or are proposing a handful of things that are uh, we're hoping to get an order on some of these additional programs. 
uh, by the end of the month, and, and hopefully they bite on some of them. Uh, one of the solutions that they did approve for us earlier this year is, okay, the incentives aren't working. We'll let you try BGE-owned multifamily, um, multifamily charging infrastructure. And that's worked. They gave us the opportunity to put in just 40, 40 dual port level twos, and they were taken up like that. And this is something that we didn't necessarily see ahead of time. We got to start thinking about outreach to properties that otherwise we knew wouldn't be interested in incentives, uh, limited income properties uh, around our territory, just to see, hey, would they be interested in EV charging infrastructure if we told them, uh, we'll put it in, we'll own and operate it, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, and we'll also charge the customers for the energy that's there too. So, you know, it's kind of a set and forget, and it worked. There are a couple of, in that initial run of 40, there are a couple of sites that are very squarely limited income sites that probably wouldn't have seen charging for a decade, if not 20 years or longer. Um, and so, you know, that's been interesting, but that's worked. Uh, our EV rideshare program already talked about a little bit. Um, private network public infrastructure for multifamily. One of the things that we thought about is, can we change our incentive definition a little bit? And this is something that we worked hand in hand in with Pepco as well. Uh, what, why don't we expand the definition of multifamily to include public sites that are not at these properties, but are very convenient to these properties where customers might be going anyway. Walmart parking lots, Target parking lots, gas stations, whatever the case may be. If it's convenient to where they live, can we incentivize private networks to install their infrastructure there? Yes, uh, EVgo, Electrify America are out there doing this, but maybe we can shift them in the direction of these particular sites at these particular Walmarts that are very close to a lot of public, uh, of uh, multifamily housing. You know, that's a potential solution. We'll see if we get approval on that too. Uh, can we offer, again, thinking about that equity side of it, can we get permission to offer a lower rate on our own public charging infrastructure at least, you know, we can't tell those private networks what they can charge, but can we get permission from the Maryland Public Service Commission to offer a lower rate for multifamily customers, at least during this transition period when there's not charging available at their, you know, at their home base. Um, and then limited income multifamily resident EV car share program. This is one that came out of a, a stakeholder discussion. We had these really large stakeholder discussions as we were thinking about putting more proposals into the commission and someone came up with this idea and, you know, it's, a little outside the box. It's not all that expensive when you think about it compared to other programs and the impact it could have, right? Buying 15 vehicles, 15 level two chargers and installing it just to start that, that conversation happening and provide an opportunity for point to point. Again, if it helps 10 families, 100 families, in this case, you're talking about 15 properties. There are 15 properties of 100 units each. That's a pretty, pretty neat impact early on in time to start to get word out and see what works, what doesn't. So my question here is, to you is this. So, so we've got to learn from, from history, right? It, so that we don't repeat mistakes or that, we, that we're able to see how if things work so that we can do things better. And you have that opportunity in the district given where you are right now. And so our experience thus far with multifamily, it's been a challenge. And I would say, learn from it and let's work on some solutions together. And so my question to you or my, my challenge statement to you is this regarding mobility and transportation to achieve DC Metro's carbon and equity goals. A critical obstacle to overcome is integrated EV infrastructure planning and development under the DC Housing Authority's redevelopment plans, especially for private property managers, such as those eligible for, but not taking full advantage of BG's grants. If you, if you recall, that housing plan is likely to include some privatization. So how do you address this challenge not just for that that owned by the the dc housing authority but also for those that end up getting privatized too thank you oh yeah absolutely <laughs> thank you All right, so now it's up to you. We're going to go to Slido. If you look on the screen, I don't know if you're able to, if your cameras will catch that with the QR code. Is it, is it bright enough to catch the QR code? All right, let's see if it will. Otherwise, you just want to go to slido.com. 
and I'll ask you for a, a login. It's DC21Q4. I'm going to keep my eyes seeing if everybody's able to get in. Every vote counts. Uh, it's always a great idea here to just get in the habit of putting your vote in. And we're going to go around. So what we do is we're going to take the next 10 minutes and dig into these obstacle statements. You should see them all now. Uh, and I'm going to go, everybody get the QR code? Because I'm going to go to the website now so we can see this together. Um, present this. All right. Okay, so votes are starting to come in. They're going to come in over the next 10 minutes. But I think what's helpful for you when you make this vote is to know who's in the room with you so you know who you'd be working with potentially to overcome this obstacle. We do our best to fill this room with a really inspiring spectrum of leaders, public and private. So I want to invite you just to introduce yourself very briefly. Just the organization you work for or your specialty, one or the other. Uh, let's see, we heard from Shell and Eric, but let's go right next to you. If you push the button on your microphone, that'll work. If you'd introduce yourself, please. Good morning, my name is Shelly Cohen. I work for Intellectual. I'm director of Clean Technology Business Development. Welcome. Uh, Tom Drake with uh, Rolls-Royce uh, Power Systems, and my focus is on Good morning, and I'm Stephen, Energy One Solutions International. We focus on maximizing the participation of the EIFs in the energy markets. And Zach, if you hold one second, I'm going to come behind you, and then I'll come back to you. We're doing introductions. Hi, I'm Cynthia Wiley, Policy Analyst with the Department of Energy and Environment, working on transportation and mobility. Hello, Steve McDonald, Holland and Knight. I have our um, energy and clean technology group, as well as focus on federal funding, which is increasingly popular, obviously. <laughs> yes, expert in federal funding here. And by the way, our breakfast sponsor. So if we could give Tate a round of applause. Thank you. <clears throat> Tate and Holland and Knight are our default host sponsors of our programming, not only in Washington, D.C., but also in Boston and Chicago. So thank you, Tate. All right, over here. Uh, Audrey Schulman from Heat. We work with natural gas systems towards uh, network ground source heat pumps. Good morning, everybody. Molly Battle from Accenture. I run our EV work in North America. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Kathy Leo from Nevada. I pick up an energy sustainability. Perfect. 
Good morning, and my time to the team. Just been uh, one of the greater Washington region Clinton Cities Coalition. Um, one of our four days. Also, for the former New York State Center, where I chair the Committee on Environmental Conservation and Bring Fleets in the Area, Climate Justice and Equity. Hello, Teresa Backus. I'm the Associate Director of the Building Innovation Hub. I am, um, I work closely with HG, DC Green Bank, DOEE to drive demand for high performing buildings. I'll give it back to Zach. Oh, Zach. Good morning, Zach. Good morning, Todd House. I'm in the Corporate Public Policy Planning Office, Washington. Good morning, Lynette Ignis with WSP, and I need transportation for the DC office. Zachary Fogg with WSP, focusing on bus fleet electrification. Good morning, Zach Lytle. Uh, I'm one of the fellows that works with HG to support all the uh, SIP awards. Andrew Smith with WSP, um, Southeast Development. Great. Uh, next up, please go ahead, one more time. Yes, sir. Uh, Good morning, Robert Thorne, uh, former DC Water Alarm, and uh, more presently, CEO of Public Performance Management. We're a large CDB or CDB in 75 Biggest Enterprise in the district, and uh, we support uh, renewable, renewable and sustainable uh, operations at EGS. Thank you, Rob. All right, so let's get into the voting. Now you have an idea of the potential in the room, right? We've got a great array of resources to tackle just about any obstacle we want in front of us uh, if we were to collaborate together and be specific on a critical obstacle that needs to be overcome. So with that knowledge of who's in the room and these obstacles you see before you, where is your vote going and why? And do you have questions you need answered to put your vote to a specific place. Uh, if you can't see them well on the screen, if you're on Slido, they'll show right up on your screen so you can look at them. You can change your vote until I call time on voting. So has anyone already got their vote in? Was it a clear decision for you? Anybody? Eric, where'd your vote go? Uh, sorry, I, uh, I ended up voting for Shell Cities. Uh, um, one of the things I can talk about is Thank you, Eric. And Devesh, I liked your point too about not seeing multifamily as just the multifamily high rise, but that local resource for shopping and getting people to, you know, see that as infrastructure and invest in that makes a lot of sense as well. Any other people have their votes in and willing to share where their vote went and why? We've got 16 in, so. Uh, Anybody else? All right, let's go. We're going to go Betty Ann Kane, and then we'll come to you, Tom, and then to you, Jay. Yeah. 
Interesting. Right. Okay. That's a great point. Um, I'm going to come to Tom, but did you have a, a response that you've thought of, Eric, to that issue? Yeah. Um, well, I will say the, the old sprinkle, the uh, WPP is making sure that the city is possible by full and as possible as possible. Um, I say that knowing full well that I would have liked to if I wasn't in excruciating back pain right now. Um, but uh, one of the things I am very much looking forward to is the new curbside uh, permitting process and regulations, especially that has been opened up for permitting and RPP for residential parking permits and everything. We're very excited that you got it. Um, and I know the, the folks have been working on that and getting a, yelled at a lot. Um, but uh, I know that's coming very soon, especially to help with the curbside traffic impact. And um, I, I, will, I, I definitely do agree with the point that looking at fleet of having dedicated spaces where they can park all the time um, and it helps you know, drastically reduce the amount of logistical issues of where to, where to charge and park, where uh, district residents are. That, that they wish it could be the same thing, but um, a lot of times the access is hard to do. Um, I'm very excited for you to eventually read our draft of the roadmap because we definitely approach a lot of those questions in there as well. Um, once again, one hand, definitely behind my back. Thank you. That's a good question. Yeah, let's go to you, Tom, and then Jay. Yeah, I, I voted for the, uh, the minimizing of the, uh, the permitting and interconnection process. That's, you know, from a project development perspective, that's always a hurdle. Um, I think and also looking at the stakeholders we have in here, there's maybe some people that can also affect that um, you know, process. And, and you know, obviously, there's the understanding of the effect of that installation and that interconnection, but it's, it's the, the, the speeding of that allows the greater implementation of that long term. Hmm. So and we'll, I want to do put a, a plug in for Baltimore Gas and Electric. They have a history of really great distributed generation programs. We do a lot of good generation projects in the in, in the Baltimore, Greater Baltimore area, and they they do a great job of incentivizing distributed generation. Just a free plug for you. There you go. Yeah. Uh, so Jay, I'll come to you, and then Shell's got a response, I think, to some of the points being made.
I'm going to come to Shell, but I think it's going to be good to come back to Devesh and Neka regarding interconnection optimization and kind of to hear your thoughts on well, what have you learned, how to, what's standing in the way of the level of speed that people were wanting, and how could we maybe address that issue as part of potentially addressing Shell's um, popular obstacle statement. So I'm coming over to you, Shell, but I want to make sure this side, uh, if there's anyone has a response, well, I want to make sure I, I, I log you. So I'll come to you, Alon. Anyone else? Great, I'll come to you as well. So let's go, with Shell, first. Thanks. I completely accept all your support. I actually want to throw my support behind the meshes. So that is another tribute to Alon and Devesh and the team that they're putting together to Some of them are pharmaceutical sales reps, and nice big houses where you can stick solar and milk into your journey. But a lot of them are your um, Xfinity, your Comcast fans, your TV and phone folks, right? Where they live in multi-family housing. So that's an important thing to tackle, and uh, I look very good to them. Thank you. Uh, let's go along to you, and then I'll come uh, to you after I want. Okay, uh, well, that's a very difficult choice. I feel like Shell's proposal, especially <laughs> the notion of a shared multi model charging hubs. Uh, but uh, I do have uh, a little background where well, I worked briefly for Peter for five years, and we privately designed the energy market specifically for Peter and a lot of COI issues. And so I would like to, to vote. Uh, for uh, like a very um, uh, proposal, I, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Uh, uh, by the way, my two best engineers have been in my career as well from Nigeria, so <laughs> there is something in the DNA. Right? So, 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 the not, Neka was not one of those engineers. Like, <laughs> 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 So in any case, uh, I'm, I'm very concerned. I, I see a future of the power grid as a constellation of micro gates and the transportation of fleets uh, are uh, mobile micro gates. And, uh, and there is an optimal way uh, to, to basically integrate those fleets into the future of the power grid. And I think, I think that's uh, my own interest, basically, is to helping to bridge the gap uh, between those mobile microgrids and the power markets and uh, the power grid operators at uh, this vision level or at uh, the level. Thank and you, that's, Alan. That's why I, I think it's a key uh, area to focus on. Thank you. Good morning. I know this one didn't get a lot of votes, but it intrigued me. Uh, this was on the, on the DC housing. Uh, trying to make progress in educating them on when they do developments. Uh, they do invest a lot of money. Uh, I think that the young lady from the Baltimore area raised a very big issue about time. And, uh, and, and I think the other thing is that because we have so much public housing across the region, across the country, someone's got to start advancing that issue with that they make capital development. So. Thank you. Uh, and, and actually, in one of our sessions, we had great opening remarks, I believe, from someone from D.C., uh, the Housing Authority. Zach, do you remember who we had uh, provide opening remarks? I wonder if you remember. I'll get his name. He was outstanding, and I really felt the support of his organization for what we're doing. So we might be able to bring him in to that conversation. Uh, let's see. So I wanted to come and circle back to the utility leaders in response to the interconnection, the need for accelerated interconnection. Rekha. Sure, so uh, uh, first, thank you so much for the, for the, uh, for the quality endorsement here. I, I cut my teeth in the market for people in ISO, in ISO New England, so I'm on the ISO. So back when I was running the descending club auctions back then, so I'm a bit of a markets nerd now, so I'll tell about that after. <laughs> um, so I think in terms of the interconnection process, it's actually two different things to consider, right? So I think, it, Part of what I said in the beginning of my remarks is that the utility is changing, and that is not only external change, but then also internally the way we think about it, our processes. And I think in the context of uh, new energy technologies that, that do different things, uh, one of the challenges is that internally we are have to think differently about how we look at it from a system planning perspective. So, for example, uh, 
if you tell me that you want to install five 100 kW bus batteries, right, uh, with the understanding that these batteries may be charged at different times, say that you know they take advantage of a program where they're charged on peak. The way that our internal systems are designed to evaluate that type of project is to take 100 kW and multiply it times five and say that's the peak demand for that system, even though the charging may not actually occur at any time series that peak demand would be hit. And so internally, that requires some thinking on our end to think through how we can implement the process and evaluate these types of technologies. So that's the first part of it. The second part is, I think I tried to get out of it in my comments, is to the extent that these interconnections, to the extent that these projects tend to get very big, what then happens is that they, they tend to get very expensive. And from the developer's perspective, we often hear developers will say, hey, look, you know, we are um, contributing to climate change uh, mitigation, right? So utility, it makes it difficult if you penalize us as a developer for carrying all of these costs when the benefits of these types of programs will be extended to people outside of the context of this specific, this specific project. So I often say that sometimes the role of the utility is the clearinghouse for cost and benefits associated with Projects. And so I think one of the things that we try to evaluate and, and you know, make the case for moving forward is that the extent to which utility support for some of these utility side of your interconnection costs, if they grow, then I think that's one of the things that helps uh, you know, accelerate the deployment of uh, you know, some of these larger costs, but then also larger uh, benefit programs, uh, not only sort of in the short term with a specific customer, but then also in the long term for the grid as a whole. Thank you. Interesting point. Uh, Devesh. Yeah, I mean, I'll add it, and you kind of touched on this, Neko, but utilities all over the country, including Exelon utilities, are looking at uh, alternative benefits cost analysis, right? Because our commissions continually ask us, what's the, what's the benefit to rate payers? What are the costs? And this is, we're, we're entering these very unique spaces now when you start talking about climate change because of all of the benefits that it could drop, right? Health benefits uh, up at the very top of it. Well, if, if you're looking at health benefits for residents, that can also decrease the costs of providing health care within a city like the district, right? All of these things are things that we could be taking into consideration, but we have to start innovating more in terms of how we look at benefits and costs. And that's a difficult thing to do. And I would say that there's opportunity for everybody in this room, right? Those, those interconnector people that are coming in with projects, things like that, and they see benefits for the communities to help the utilities and help commissions understand what the benefits may be for customers uh, and for communities and be supportive of alternative analyses of something like interconnection policies, right? And the costs and how those costs are allocated. Getting that support is important. I will just add one other thing. That one of the things of getting to, to start some things and, and serve as an incubator of some of these technologies with, for instance, building our own public charging network we're getting to walk a mile in y'all shoes and, and people that are interconnected because we have to deal with our own interconnection, our new business group, our interconnection group, and work together with them to figure out, well, you know, where are the headaches here? Why are we doing things this way? And our network is you know, relatively small, 500 chargers across the state. It's, it's significant, but it's not everything that's going to be needed. And it served as a good way for us to gain knowledge about what are the pain points. Uh, and so getting more of that knowledge of what are the pain points, either through walking a mile in, in your shoes or having those open conversations about what those pain points are helps us to be better utilities. And, and it is something that we have to resolve. And so, you know, that's certainly a really important one of these four options that are up here, is thinking about how can we streamline interconnection, reduce costs, uh, increase speed, especially given how quickly EV fleets might or could take off. So, you know, hmm. I would say all of these are really interesting topics. You know, I've been looking at them and, and thinking, is there a silver thread between them, among them, that would help synthesize this into a focal point? But I've found if we don't take these obstacles and find a way to wrap our minds around them, either by location or by a specific issue, it's hard to stay engaged. So when I look at Shell's obstacle statement, my takeaway is, the obstacle is the lack of multimodal green charging hubs. If I'm going to remember one thing, I'm going to remember that from hers is they're, they're not here. We don't have enough of them, and so there's a lack there, and that's an obstacle to getting where we want to. And I think about Eric's point about this equity, equitable access. Do multimodal green charging hubs uh, support equitable access? Could they? If so, that could be layered in 
to attacking that obstacle? And would potentially that address housing with multimodal green charging hubs that supported equitable access? Could it also touch on uh, getting to housing? I'm putting it out there. Shell, this is really, you're kind of leading on your obstacle statement here. By the way, we're gonna close the vote soon. The 30 votes, 34 votes registered. There are more of you in the room. This is the moment to make sure your vote is heard. Uh, Sev, welcome. We're on slido.com and the code is DC21Q4. Do you see how those could synthesize if you were to synthesize this? Some of those multimodal will serve different constituents. Uh, but I go back to the anchor tenants. I guess it's really important to figure out a couple anchor tenants that are probably going to drive the decision on location. And, um, Thank you. At the risk of continuing, like, helping all my competitors here, it, it <laughs> as well. I, I would definitely say yes as well. And, and one thing that we learned from the work that we're doing in the EV rideshare space is that most uh, most rideshares end or start in limited income neighborhoods. Many rideshare drivers are limited income drivers. And in talking to the rideshare companies, one of the, the primary reasons they're not going into certain cities or they're choosing some cities over others is because of the infrastructure. And if we're creating multimodal hubs that provide fast and, and ubiquitous uh, charging infrastructure in the places where those rides are happening, right, convenient for where drivers need to go or are likely to all that data is there. That could be part of the solution, especially if you couple that somehow with more uh, affordable rides for, for people that are in limited income neighborhoods in that transportation. Nice. So, so I was going to say, uh, uh, in terms of the development of these solutions, I, I also keep my book on my shelf as well. Uh, and uh, so there's a clear favorite here in the place. Uh, so um, what I will say, you know, one of the major things that we base it a very, very good job of talking about it, but you know, I try to think about not only kind of the micro and sort of economic aspects of these, but what are sort of the bigger picture sort of issues, right? And um, I once at a conference said uh, the phrase regulatory entrepreneurship, and I mean, you would have thought it was heresy at her, you know what I mean? And, and I think what we meant by that, but it's doing exactly what they said. So historically, when we say things like rate payer advocacy, from the utility perspective, rate payer advocacy has only meant how much ratepayers pay on their bills. But to the extent that ratepayer advocacy as it relates to climate change means what is the air, what is the quality of the air that ratepayers breathe? Um, you know, what are the healthcare costs that ratepayers have? And what is the utility growth to help you facilitate some of those things? To the extent that we start to expand the universe of how we quantify benefits, I think to Shell's point, you know, when you have, you know, a, a kind of a community, you know, call it health model in which there are benefits that are all types of great pairs. I think when you start to have those conversations, I think that essentially kind of clears the world or clears the way for the utility, I think, to uh, you know, step in and maybe sort of offer a different you know, ability to support these types of projects. Because ultimately, uh, you know, to the extent that we can, right, I think you know, the utility is in a position to do so. Right? It's just a matter of uh, you know, kind of changing the perspective of how we quantify uh, you know, cost and benefits. Hey, hey uh, you know, the last thing I'll say, one of the smartest people I ever talked to was uh, she's a commissioner in Rhode Island. Her name is uh, Commissioner Abigail Adams. And she said to me once, um, utilities, you guys talk to me a whole lot about uh, potential, right? You talk to me about potential benefits, you talk to me about et cetera. But you know, what you have done is you say to me, um, you are providing me with the analogy she used was you are providing me with tools and ingredients in the kitchen, and you're dropping them on my table without any guarantee that those tools and should result in the food that you need. And I think that in terms of quantifying the benefit, we gotta be challenging with that. Right? We know it's like gravity. We know that clean air, you know, we know air is going to get better as a result of uh, you know, transportation electrification. Right? We know this, but the effort to quantify that, I think that's the difficult part. So I think the extent that we can unify the capabilities around how we quantify that, I think 
that's the linchpin that, that moves us forward. Very well said. And I walk away often from these stakeholder challenges, and, and I'm really fortunate that commissioners across all our cities take such an investment in these dis, uh, discussions. We'll have the chair of the Illinois Commerce Commission in Chicago, major legislation was just passed in Chicago. She's been active in our work, the chair of the EV Working Group and of Water, um, Maria Bocanegra, Illinois Commerce Commissioner. They're active in these type of discussions. And I often walk away thinking we need to change the cost benefit analysis to be the consequence benefit analysis where we can come at this and submit consequences that often fall outside the dollar sign that need to be quantified. And, and that can help us get aligned to get through this inertia, which is basically misunderstanding of the true consequences and benefits. So Eric, I'm going to give you the last word because we're going to go to the next phase, which is hearing from task forces that are actually working right now to deliver 12 month solutions. And you're next going to vote on whether or not they're doing what they say they're going to do. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad I get to open and close this discussion now. Uh, there were two pieces of information I actually wanted to pass on to folks. Uh, one from our own stakeholder engagement session uh, was regarding the one key aspect of the CDC Act, which the roadmap has found it was that first goal of 50% uh, uh, scaling up to 100% in 2030, 2045. That also applied taxi cabs as well. And so when knowing that they had that goal set on, Thank you. So please join me, a round of applause for all of our speaker challengers. Yes, well done. Another round of applause for Shell Izzy in her winning obstacle statement. Yes, uh, welcome, that was fantastic. So now you can see we start taking key ingredients from the other obstacle statements that we don't want to have lost, and we think how could they best fold in to this winning obstacle, the equitable access port, whether or not we can leverage housing. Those things circulate in our mind, but we focus now on working together in teams at these breakout tables over here to come up with a 12 month solution with three quarterly milestones that could have the greatest impact on this obstacle. That's what we're gonna get to. Now you're gonna get to hear from task forces that are working right now to deliver 12 month solutions and have quarterly milestones that they have to report on every quarter in these meetings. So that's where we go next. I'm gonna get you set up so that you can uh, see our first group to come up and present. Let's see here, I can do this easily. All right. We are gonna get into it. We do keep a leaderboard, by the way. Your vote counts. 
Every quarterly milestone that a task force achieves, we allocate two points to that city. See the World Series things comes back here. Right? Uh, every team that's able to deliver a 12-month solution gets four points. So currently, the leaderboard right now on delivering on promises made shows New York in the lead with 28 points, Chicago in second place, Washington is in fourth place. However, today we have several task forces presenting, which would give them an opportunity to get their points up. First up on the task force updates we have is 20Q4. They are coming to report to you on their 12 month anniversary and 12 month solution. This was a team co-led by leaders from WSP, DC Metro. It had involvement from NG and a whole host of others that joined this task force to do some pretty incredible things. I'd like to invite up the spokesperson. Sev, are you gonna provide this uh, update or who's providing the update for 20Q4? This may be me uh, that's gonna do this, so I will. <laughs> Reason behind that, there's some RFPs out there that I need to be the one to take care of giving you the update. I also got involved on this task force. Uh, here's what they promised they were going to do. Form a coalition, launch a working group to identify and advocate for zero emissions infrastructure investment priorities. Uh, this is what they got done. WMATA's uh, board of directors approved transition, transitioning the existing fleet to zero emissions by 2045. This task force was able to get 22 agencies in the region to sign off on a letter to Congress underlining the importance of why zero emission bus fleets are critical to the region. It was pretty remarkable that that happened. I don't know if you saw the image of it, but we're talking, just help me Sev or someone with some of the leaders that signed off on this. Well, we had the CEO of DC Metro signed off on this, other agencies. Anybody remember uh, who else do we have? We had Dash. We had, we had the CEO of Pepco sign off, CEO of DC Water signed off on this. So it was a pretty incredible statement by some of the most important impactful stakeholders in the region. They also created a GIS equity environmental justice uh, GIS map, which was done in partnership with Maryland Department of Transportation that got involved with this task force. That map is live, it has layers, so you can see the region based on economic vulnerability, environmental justice communities. And I think what I learned with maps is now I want every task force to consider the power of having maps included in what you can do. Uh, if we go after this intermodal um, issue, I highly recommend every table to consider what could GIS maps play in terms of a powerful communication tool in what you come up with. Um, this is the example, if you can see it, of all the signatories that you have here. So including the mayor's office of DC, um, DASH, Metropolitan Council of Governments, as I mentioned, DC Water, DC Green Bank, PEPCO, NLX, uh, the Maryland Zero Emission Group. Uh, it was quite impressive that this got done. And on the right hand side, you see the example of that map. Now this group has committed to do in January of 2022, they're going to do a workshop likely in conjunction with the EV Auto Show to talk about how they continue to move forward this progress on stakeholder alignment for expediting zero emission bus fleets in the region. Uh, that is that group. Now I'm gonna hand it over to DC Water and after what will happen on your phone is I'm gonna make the polling live so you can say whether or not this team actually did what they said they were gonna do in their, in their time frame. So let me please bring up uh, Cheryl Uday and Opera, please welcome. They're going to give you the update from the DC Water Task Force. <clears throat> I'll give you this microphone to share. Yeah. Good morning. Thank you for uh, having us and having us be a part of this opportunity. So um, as HG mentioned, um, our 12-month solution was really looking at a unified outline of DC water projects that considered and combined our equity goals, our carbon reduction goals, and our vulnerability goals. This was really about um, decreasing or eliminating silos and um, looking at how we can address some of the district's most pressing climate change 
issues by first identifying what the equity meant within the context of this challenge, which took, it took us about a month to do um, and wanting to see and understand the communities that we were impacting by looking at an area deprivation um, index, but also really just asking ourselves at the end of the day, why is this work important and who is it going to be impacting the most? And so our current milestone is around prioritizing and unifying our project portfolio, which I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. And our deliverable um, in January of 2022 is to submit a proposed outline of DC Water Project, looking at how we assess equity, how we are reducing um, our carbon footprint, and how we're becoming more resilient um, and helping um, as a region. So over the last three months, we have focused more heavily on further refining that definition of how we prioritize our project portfolio and how we unify that. So prioritization to us really is about the approach that we have taken in developing three tools, three assessment tools that look at uh, carbon equity um, and resilience and using a value effort framework to do so. That value effort framework is looking at what is the value to DC Water, what is the value that these projects are creating for the actual community and all of our stakeholders and partners involved. Our level of effort being, regardless of the value, we need to be looking at how complex it is to do, what is the political will, how much does it actually cost, and so forth. And then unifying it in short means we're continuing to ask ourselves, who is not in the room? And this is a question that we've asked ourselves since we started this, this process. Um, in the last three months, we scored our project opportunities using tools that we have developed from the ground up, and we have prioritized them, as I said, on our value effort framework. And then um, a huge part of this work that we've done across subcommittees, across our policy subcommittees and stakeholder subcommittees, is continuing to engage our partners and stakeholders, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. So our next slide, we wanted to show really quickly some of the scores that have come out of our assessment tool. Um, these are our projects that you all see on this on your right. These are the scores that we have plotted along the value effort matrix, again, taking a um, quantifying what is a very qualitative approach, I think, to how we try to work across the project portfolio. And one of the things that I've always asked myself in our task force throughout this process was, how were we doing this before this process happened? What kinds of conversations were happening as we think about how we receive projects, how we fund them, and how we prioritize them, and really the community at the core of all of that, and what would be happening absence of such a process. So as we have um, aggregated our scores and got them on this uh, map, you'll see that our renewable natural gas um, are on the in the that green circle. Kojar and Justin are in the red. This is how they plotted out on this map. And then wastewater thermal are in the blue and our solar um, is in the yellow. And what we we, our goal is to get as many of our projects in sort of that low effort, um, high value quadrant as possible. And also, as we look at this, we, it tells a good story, and I think it's about culture change. If there are projects that are yielding uh, a very high effort, but low value, um, we need to be talking about why that is. And if there are projects, honestly, that have a low equity score, we need to be having conversations as to why that is as well. So lots um, is going on, and I, we are at an interesting, I think, segue of how we are now becoming more intentional um, as we move through this process about how we continue to engage and are flexible and nimble and how we even alter our approaches based on what the community is telling us. So I'll pass it on to my esteemed colleague, Opera, who's leading a lot of that engagement. Thank you, Cheryl, and good morning, everyone. I will just be um, very quick as I advance. This is an interesting keyboard. Is this yours? Uh, yes. Okay. So this, we have actually done a lot um, within the last 11 months as it pertains to um, external outreach and how we're thinking about not only our climate goals specifically for the district, but what does equity actually mean? And I just want to say up front because it's something that um, we talked about in all of our task force meetings and subcommittee meetings that 
equity does not mean equality. And so when we talk about uh, like the benefit of things, um, that benefit doesn't mean that everyone's going to get the same type of benefit or the benefit will look the same for every community and every individual. And I think that that's something I've heard in the Philippines in the energy space my entire career. Um, even as Nick alluded to, is just something that we have to stretch ourselves to think about. So, in all of our conversations here, um, we usually are this echo chamber of brilliant minds, and we have all of these resilient and sustainable and, and sound solutions, but none of that means anything if the end user is not benefiting in a holistic um, and social human structure way. I want to use the word human that I think Audrey taught me this morning, which is not in the Webster's Dictionary, but it should be. So we are we have done the road show. We've done some congressional briefings, we've done local briefings. We briefed our partners at DOE about kind of this challenge. But the thing that I'm most excited about, which is not actually on here, is the actual community engagement that we're doing now by hosting the sessions and kind of giving our communities and our stakeholders the opportunity to do what we're all doing in this room by identifying like what's the burden, um, who's benefiting, um, and what are some of the options that we can do to look at um, changing things. Now, um, with the task force, uh, my fellow task force, you know, force members, they get very um, nervous when I say, all of this may change. You might find that some of these projects don't matter, at least to the people that we're trying to serve. And we need to be okay with that. We need to be flexible um, and start thinking about things differently. So. I am confident that we will be a milestone of, of um, the unified portfolio um, of energy options, and I am more confident that it will be a very much so unified portfolio. And none of these projects that we just talked about might be on that list at the end of the day, um, but we will be a real solution. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So inspiring to see this real impact show up from your efforts on these task forces. Uh, let's see. Uh, I, think I see a pen here. And by the way, you're going to have access to all the slide decks. Uh, we do a really nice podcast for the obstacle statements from each speaker as long as they're able to, to provide those remarks publicly. So now for those, and you can hear amazing critical obstacle statements across all our four cities. Okay, we're on to the next task force, which came out of buildings and construction. Uh, this is the task force. They have a quarterly milestone to report on here. And Teresa's here to provide that. Welcome, Teresa. Hi, everybody. Um, as HG said, um, I am part of the uh, task force. And um, the, the the milestone was uh, around the building energy. I'm sure most of you are familiar with that, but um, there was a, a on building announcement we identified uh, within the um, problem state, which was to uh, there was a very critical need, uh, specifically related to affordable housing buildings, um, un under resourced buildings, to be able to understand and address uh, energy performance in the buildings as it relates to us. Um, as you may know, we are already in cycle one test. It started this year, and it requires that buildings 50,000 square feet and larger um, meet a certain energy star score threshold, and if not, they need to improve the energy performance of the building um, following certain compliance paths. So there are a large number of, of under buildings, specifically multi family buildings, that will fall into this compliance cycle that um, do not have the uh, personnel, the contacts, to be able to improve their energy efficiency. Um, there's a concern about, a very real concern about maintaining affordability of housing um, while simultaneously performance of building performance. And so um, the task force, or the, I should say, the stakeholder challenge really on how we support these under-resourced buildings, maintain affordability, increase performance, uh, energy efficiency, um, improve indoor air quality and create um, better building for residents and people uh, in underserved communities and under resourced um, groups. So, the winning solution was to develop a um, package, a set of package solutions for these multifamily stakeholders in these multifamily buildings. 
Um, the first milestone we have achieved, which was to develop a, an outreach and communications um, package, uh, or I should say process, uh, to identify the um, the right contacts at building begin to establish relationships um, and uh, begin conversations. And so we have we achieved that with uh, and did access into the energy, the bank, you know, the energy put it in put it out, but. We've had a lot of meetings and conversations um, to really try to figure out, um, you know, who should we really be. Um, oftentimes, the contact and portfolio manager at Energy Star is not the person that is the decision maker when it comes to retrofits and um, performance decisions. Um, oftentimes, that's left to the company, or there's a there's a huge disconnect between. Who is entering benchmarking data and tracking benchmarking data, and who's actually going to be making these decisions? So we work very closely with DOE to um, overlay their uh, contact information, their building information, with the right matrix and data sources to identify um, the real owners and the real decision makers uh, for all of the multifamily affordable housing buildings that are 50,000 square feet and larger uh, that will be required to comply with that cycle one. So we've established, um, we were through that that exercise, we were able to identify the direct outreach with multiple representatives from the building, owners, guardians, tenant representatives, um, decision makers, and uh, we um, had a, I guess it started probably in April as a result of the stakeholder challenge, but we began having discussions with key uh, stakeholders from each of these buildings. Um, and that is, you know, there are hundreds of buildings, but we, in the time between April and now, we agree that a reasonable amount of buildings to tackle was around 20 to 25. So we're, we're beginning to, to uh, we're using this process, this outreach process that we've developed to now um, continue to reach out to the really leading building owners. So we, um, and it's, you know, it's not just going to, um, percolate with the remainder of the task force, but this process that we were involved as part of the task force to be able to do their outreach throughout not just that cycle one, but future cycles as that as the, the square footage continues to drop. So we're really proud of that. Um, you know, we we've been able to have a lot more direct conversations with the people behind the buildings. You know, I think so much of our conversations we talk about carbon reduction, we talk about buildings, we talk about technology. Not enough conversation happening about the people and the residents and the tenants. Buildings exist for people, so a big goal of this task force was to have more, you know, resident-focused conversations. Um, milestone two was to develop package solutions, um, and we were able to achieve that milestone. We had a event in October. We called it Success with Vets. That was an outcome of the task force. Um, we had, I believe it was something like 15 or 16 concurrent affordable housing meetings um, held virtually. We had representatives from DOE, DC Sustainable Energy Utility, DC Green Bank, um, Building Innovation Hub, and um, energy consultants at each of these meetings. And we were able to assist um, about 17% of the total non compliant buildings just in this first set of meetings alone. Um, and over two, over 2.2 million and about 8,000 residents. 2.2 million square feet, I should say, and 8,000 residents with the DC system. So we're really pleased with the outcome of those meetings and the, the achievement of that milestone. And we are working closely with our partners and the task force on um, DC's upcoming retrofit accelerator. I did get the okay to mention it. I can't talk too much about it, but. Um, it is a, uh, going to be a series of, of resources that is very close in alignment with the outreach that we conducted as part of this task force. Um, and next, we're going to be moving on to um, developing auditor training programs for DC residents, as well as uh, making policy recommendations for future cycles of steps based on what we learned throughout this task force process. So we are really excited to continue the work we've done. I think we've laid some the groundwork for um, how the city can have um, you know, direct conversations and impact uh, with not only the affordable housing building, but with all owners. So thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> thank you. That's great.
Very exciting. So we need your, we need your vote. Uh, I want to go ahead and go back to Slido. You've, you've heard that these task forces have been working. Do you feel that they're accomplishing goals aligned with their initial intentions? Um, this is all peer driven. So if you go there, you can look back over these. I think I've, I don't think I'm, is there one more? Gridmod, where's the Gridmod team? Uh, grid modernization, that's with Audrey. Uh, yeah, come on up, Audrey. While people are voting, you can give the last one here. Audrey uh, Shulman won the speaker challenge for grid modernization regarding her work on how to optimize uh, g gas infrastructure moving forward. Um, so, the, uh, you need that? Uh, the team was unable to meet because I was in the midst of many, many deadlines. Um, uh, in spite of uh, Zach's kind, uh, you know, persistence with many people, um, but instead, uh, you know, I went solo and did lots of research. Oh, and the idea was basically to come up with a transition plan to share, you know, in a public manner to create uh, an ec uh, equitable energy transition for Washington D.C. Um, but instead, uh, the state I talked to a lot of stakeholders. What you want to do is first make sure that the incentives are right, that the stakeholder that you know that the stakeholders want, you know their needs, and you know their obstacles. So um, I uh, set up meetings with BP Water, Washington Gas, researchers, advocates, and municipal staff, and already have those meetings. Um, I've identified preliminary data sets to clarify the need and uh, the opportunities that are available. So um, hopefully stay tuned, but hope there will be a variety of exciting developments uh, soon, and the task force will begin to kick off in many ways. Um, but thanks, that's it. Thank you, Audrey. Yeah, thank you. All right. All right, so please, if you would, just go ahead and go to your phones, and I see people are getting their votes in now, which is great. Um, Sure, uh, yes, let me find a good way to do that for you. Uh, let's see here. QR code is right there, perfect. Yeah. All right, great, I see the votes coming in, that's really important. So that's three quarterly milestones, right? Two each, that's six, plus the 12 month solution presented by Q4 2020 that you're voting on, which would be 10 points around the table for Washington based on you feeling that these task forces are making the promise, the progress that they set out to do with their proposed solutions and milestones. Okay, great. Thank you for giving feedback. Uh, these are all task forces, by the way. If you're interested in getting involved, they're very open to having more people join and support them. This is all volunteer work, so more hands make less work. Uh, so I'm sure they would welcome your participation if one of these really speaks to you. Um, all right, now you know what's involved before we go into the breakout room work. There is this updates that happen quarterly in our meetings on how well the, the selected solution in the next part uh, is able to progress forward. So on your name badges, you have a table number. Uh, Neka will have to find that if we will get your, I'll look it up for you. But hopefully you've kept your name badge. Behind you, you have tables here with numbers at them. You're gonna go to these tables and you're gonna spend until 11.20 at these tables if you want to use time to get a refresh of coffee or use the restroom, et cetera, grab some more food, you can as well. But by 11.20, you need to be prepared with a spokesperson at your table to pitch a 12-month solution with three quarterly milestones that would best overcome the winning obstacle that we have from Shell. All right, any questions on that approach? That's what you're gonna do. If you don't know your table number or if you might have misplaced your badge, just come find me and I'll let you know your table number. But that's what you get to work on now. And I purposely tried to mix up these tables 
so that you have all the resources you need at these tables to do something extraordinary. All right. Yeah.